uh, thanks to all of you for being with us on a rather strange night um, in a strange year. We've found that these virtual programs have been a, uh, a source of respite and insight um, through this pandemic time. And uh, uh, today of all days, uh, we're watching with concern the events in Washington, DC, and we're thinking about the uh, unique perspective that uh, working at and advocating for an uncannily well-preserved 19th century artist environment gives you on current events. Uh, we've seen that this country has come through hard times before. The election of 1876 has been mentioned. Um, so when we look back with a, a, a wonderful interlocutor today at these beautiful images from the misty past, uh, let's remember that those times were not so much less tumultuous than our own. Um, as I've mentioned, this uh, speaker today is really uh, particularly gifted at close looking and um, uh, reading uh, challenging objects, not least of those uh, by Frederick Edwin Church and has done so uh, to great effect in a really influential book, which was the reason why we wanted to bring her to speak to our membership. Um, and that was uh, Frederick Church, The Art and Science of Detail. Um, and as that last word alludes, looking closely at Frederick Church paintings, the, the particular way uh, this artist deploys detail uh, and how that relates to uh, the scientific culture of the time and uh, a wide variety of other concerns. We'll hear a little taste of uh, that research today, but also some other uh, newer directions that relate uh, usefully to the Alana Permanent Collection. Uh, professor Jennifer Robb is Associate Professor, now tenured. Congratulations at uh, Yale's History of Art Department. Um, her interests also include uh, beyond Olana and church photography. I was pleased to learn as uh, our own interest at Olana turned to the photography collection. She has an exciting new book under contact, uh, contract with Princeton University Press called, uh, let me get that title, Relics of War. So we'll be eagerly looking forward to that um, similar act of um, slow looking, deep diving into one single um, evocative photograph uh, at the end of the Civil War. Um, so we have somebody who does not shy away from um, the tumultuous politics of the past and present and uh, will give us maybe a, a little bit of a breather from the, the doom scrolling uh, of the news today um, and uh, take us to um, far different places. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Rob. Hi, everyone. Good evening. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you and um, and get started here. There we go. Hopefully everyone can see that. So I first just want to thank you all for being here, as Will said, during um, one of the, the many tumultuous moments we've had uh, over the past year or so, um, and to take a little break from that. And I want to thank Will for the invitation. It's always a pleasure. Uh, I wish we were all <laughs> there in person. Um, and to also thank Margo Isaacs for, for all the coordination and, and for the recent technical help as well. Um, I hope many of you are, are close by spending time in the landscape or a solace right now and so particularly needed. Um, so thanks all of you too for your support for uh, such an incredible uh, uh, artist's environment that Alana is thinking of not just the house and the collection but also the landscape and I'll talk about all of those things tonight with you. So without further ado, I will get started. In the 1870s, Shortly after returning from the Middle East, Frederick Church, then the nation's most famous landscape painter, began creating a very different kind of landscape, an estate for his family that comprised a house and 250 acres of grounds in the Hudson Valley. He named this place Olana. Rather than paint on canvas, he worked here with the physical environment. Rather than making a representation of nature, he turned to the natural world itself. In the 1850s and 60s, he made his reputation on large scale, highly detailed pictures of iconic national landmarks like Niagara and stunning composite paintings of the climatic diversity of the Ecuadorian Andes. With Alana, Church undertook a more expansive and yet more personal endeavor. 
This evening, I wanna think about this endeavor, how the landscape painter brought his practice into the actual landscape, changing media, we might say, from canvas to environment, from first learning to sketch trees in the Hudson River Valley with his teacher, Thomas Cole, in the 1840s, planting thousands of them at Alana in the 1870s. I also want to look at the most significant canvas that hangs at Alana, El Casne Petra of 1874. He made this painting in response to his Middle Eastern journey and while at work on his new home. He then gave it to his wife and they hung it in the family's sitting room above the fireplace, across from a large arched window that offers a striking view of the landscape Church was simultaneously creating. Church had begun his artistic education in the Hudson Valley and the Catskill Mountains, learning to paint, learning to see with Thomas Cole as his guide and mentor. Church's early sketches most often focused on Cole's signature forms, trees, Cole had developed his arboreal interests, even say obsession, in his own early years as an artist. And these are two of Cole's first known drawings. The work on the right, which he captioned from nature, depicts a strange and fantastically anthropomorphic specimen. It's contorted limbs creating a form that seems capable of walking off the page. Cole's landscape paintings are so often built up from the trees. Splintered trunks, freshly cut stumps, windswept branches, jutting, leaning, fallen, standing. Trees do not just frame the compositions, they become actors within them. The tree as foundational trope was a lesson that church clearly absorbed first visible in canvases like the Dur Oak at Hartford, two versions of which Church produced in 1846 at the end of his two-year apprenticeship with Cole, and the left is in Alana's collection. These compositions are anchored by a strong symbol, the tree as a kind of naturalized declaration of independence. In it, in these trees, the Charter Oak, the story goes, Connecticut's charter was hidden in 1687 as British agents came to collect it and revoke the colony's rights to self-governance. But the tree is also an incredible specimen, the knobs and knots on the thick trunk, each delicate leaf precisely delineated. It is only through such vivid specificity that the tree convincingly becomes the bearer of history and memory. One year later, Church produced Storm in the Mountains, which places Cole's iconic form of the blasted tree front and center. Instead of history, here we have environmental drama. Two years after leaving Cole Tootle, Church became one of the youngest artists at age 22 ever elected as a full member of the prestigious National Academy of Design. That same year, 1848, also brought tragedy, the premature death of his mentor at only 47 years old. Church would grapple with this loss in a number of different canvases, including To the Memory of Cole, a reworking of Cole's The Cross in the Wilderness, uh, which is now the Louvre, Garlands of pink flowers swath the cross protectively in Church's painting, their hue doubled by the rosy glow overhead. The sky clears above the billowing white clouds, drawing the viewer's eyes upward. The rolling hills of the Catskills commemorate the artist's home and beloved subject, while at the left, a freshly cut tree stump gestures to Cole's favored visual trope, here as a kind of memento more. 
In Above the Clouds at Sunrise, Church returns to one of Cole's preferred sketching spots, famous for its dazzling sunrises. The younger artist imagines a weightless world, enrobed in morning mist, gnarled trees and precarious boulders appear to take flight. In a brilliant confection of pink, Church lifts us up from the ground as if for a moment that his mentor would never have allowed, we could be released from gravity, time, and history. A third painting that Church executed after Cole's death, morning, looking east over the Hudson Valley from the Catskill Mountains, presents a different meditation on his mentor's work. It is clearly indebted to his teacher's vision. And here on the right is Cole's, a view of two lakes and mountain house, Catskill Mountains, morning of 1844. While Church also departs from Cole's picture. In both, a lone man stands on a rocky ledge, back turned, looking out at the expansive view mountains, mist, and sky beyond. Yet in the coal, and here is a detail, the man appears to be older, clutching a sketchbook under his arm, leaning on a walking stick, and dressed in a cape, items that mark him as no mere ambling hiker, but as the very personification of the romantic artist, essentially Cole himself. And here you see Matthew Brady's daguerreotype of Cole Swath dramatically in a dark, fantastic jaw of hair, which Molly comb over of the 19th century. Cole's artist exists in a space apart from commerce and capital, leisure, and pleasure. In the distance, we see what he critiques, that icon of early American tourism, the Catskill Mountain House. You can see it right up here. Which hosted so many travelers, often from Manhattan, eager to pay a premium to see the panoramic views and operatic sunrises after enduring a seven hour steamboat trip up the Hudson and an unpleasantly rocky three to four hour stagecoach ride. Cole bitterly led the development of the Catskills and in his painting, he positions the foreground as a site of critique, the realm of the solitary artist, where one might see the sprawling hotel not as a journey's climax, but as an imposition on the character of the surrounding environment. By contrast, in Church's picture, the figure who seems to be a young man in an perfectly positioned to enjoy the vista and that famous sunrise. If Cole's figure stands in the shadows associated with the exquisitely tortured arboreal form beside him, Church's traveler adopts an easy, even nonchalant pose. There is no blasted tree, just a long spindly branch that Church's figure casually leans against, his hand grasping it near the top so the form bends slightly toward him. In this work, the student muses on his own artist inheritance. We can also see him breaking free. Church developed his own artistic vision when he began to travel, journeying first not across the Atlantic Ocean to Europe, the expected path of, young, of the young ambitious American painter, but south to the Ecuadorian Andes in 1853 and again in 1857. And here you see a map of the two uh, voyages. Eschewing the art academies in London, Paris, Dusseldorf, or Rome, Church instead followed in the footsteps of a scientist, the great German naturalist Alexander von Humboldt, who had famously traveled through South America at the beginning of the 19th century. 
they exhorted landscape painters to do the same. Few took his advice, but Church did. He covered more than 1,000 miles on land through Ecuador and Colombia and made hundreds of sketches. Graphite drawings offer lucid specificity, tree limbs disappearing into the dense canopy, a mountain range spreading across a sheet of paper with Chimborazo rising in the background. Numbers are often included to correspond to notes on color and tone in his drawings, a textual mnemonics for what cannot be visually captured in gray pencil. If pencil allowed for a level of exactitude and control, oil invited a more rapid style, a wider view, and a close attention to the dynamism of color and light. In the image, even devised the sheet, forming capture other atmospheric phenomena. Such sketches were a form of fieldwork based on observation, but marked by the subjective and interpretive process that always characterizes making a work of art at any stage. Remarkable canvases resulted from these journeys, including the Andes of Ecuador of 1855 on the left and the heart of the Andes of 1859, right, which is in the Metz collection. These were works unprecedented in their scientific realism and sublime effect. In the Andes of Ecuador, light is the primary subject of the picture. The sun's white orb is placed in the top center of the canvas, a pupil-like form that appears at eye level. This circle of bright paint immediately captures the attention, not because of its placement and hue, but because it is also the one area of the canvas where Church has demonstrably built up the paint. White paint touched by yellow radiates out from the sun, becoming a warm gold this halo. The light dominates this form shape, extending horizontally over the mountaintops and vertically down the center of the canvas. Illuminating the distant winding streams, the central misty gorge, and then the grassy plateau in the foreground. For Church, who was a religious man, such illumination had an inherently spiritual connotation, and critics at the time interpreted the painting this way. It literally floods the canvas with celestial fire, one wrote, and beams with glory, sublime psalm of light. In the Andes of Ecuador, details are all present palm fronds and clusters of red blossoms and jagged boulders and grazing animals, but they are subordinated to the sunlight that demands our primary attention. It veils the foreground details, consumes the broad swath of sky and nearly obliterates on the We see celestial light before terrestrial details. The heart levels in, by contrast, in those details. Executed after his second trip to South America, the canvas would arguably, arguably become the most famous painting in the United States during the 19th century. It caused such a sensation when it was first exhibited in a Manhattan gallery in 1859 that police had to be called in to keep the street clear as people lined up to see it. The large scale composite picture, which measures more than five and a half by nearly 10 feet, was created by looking at countless numbers of his plein air studies, incorporating them by part or whole, and often entirely reimagining them to conceive of this scene. The work has no declarative focal point. Rather, here we have a seemingly endless proliferation of natural details. The sky is nearly filled with dense clouds and darkened mountaintops, blocking the metaphorical possibility of heavenly transcendence. Shadows undulate across the space, giving the entire picture a dynamism and sense of temporality. 
a path extends out into the immediate foreground and offers a way into the painting, ending in a bright cross. But here the trail stops in a verdant mass of trees and climbing vines with no apparent continuation. Church chose to sign his canvas on the dead tree trunk in the left corner of the picture. The artist's illuminated signature, and here it is along with the date, is in fact more prominent than the cross farther along the trail. So you see them, the signature here and the cross and trail over here. The sign of the individual literally precedes the icon of Christian salvation. The artist also references himself through the inclusion of a waterfall in the front center, echoing Niagara in both subject and painterly technique. I think particularly this line here, which you see echoed in the Niagara painting. The artist's body of work and the artist's body, his signature carved into the white bark, locate the self in this extravagant landscape. Subjectivity is highlighted over spiritual symbolism. The scientific is also privileged over the spiritual. The heart of the Andes includes an astounding array of flora and fauna. At the bottom right corner of the painting, broad aeroid leaves are pocked with insect bites and fan out in all directions. Branches cast a precise tangle of shadows on an exposed rock and a morning glory vine with tiny violet blooms grows above it. Below are climbing red passion flowers with their tripartite leaves and long protruding filaments. Two yellow butterflies, each with a black spot and a bird that appears to be a male kitzel with its elaborate plumage are all found near the dead tree and the artist's signature. Such paintings made Church a wealthy man, and they enabled him to return to the place of his artistic origins and to create just across the Hudson River from Thomas Cole's residence, his own home and landscape, Olana. Church began buying property here in 1860, 12 years after Cole's death, accumulating more land over the next decade. Throughout the 1870s and 80s, Church's house and grounds took shape. Although he continued painting, the artist spent less time in his Manhattan studio. His focus became Olana. The landscape painter became a landscape architect. His letters from this period are filled with news of his work on the property, some resorting to humorous hyperbole. Church wrote to his friend and fellow artist Martin Johnson Heed, opining in his letter, I have 9,631,201 problems in architecture and construction given to me to solve daily. I am busy landscape architecturing, he wrote to another friend and his eventual biographer, Charles Dudley Warner. I have nearly completed a cliff about a hundred feet high. The term landscape architecture as opposed to landscape gardening had been coined in 1863 by Calvert Vox and Frederick Law Olmsted, the designers of Central Park, which opened in 1859. The designation served as an indicator of the professional nature of the practice by mid-century and Church's use of landscape architecture undoubtedly signals his serious intentions in making Olana, despite his playful lament about the innumerable construction problems encountered daily. For his home, Church chose Calvert Vox as his consulting architect, but the artist assumed the primary role producing over 500 drawings and 200 designs for stencils in the process. He intended to build what he called a feudal castle under the modest name of a dwelling house. And I think we can all agree that modest is not the adjective that comes to mind in describing Alana. Um, and here is another beautiful 
recent photograph taken uh, by Peter Aaron. Olana absorbs all my time and attention, Church wrote to a colleague, for having undertaken to get my architecture from Persia, where I have never been, nor any of my friends either, I am obliged to imagine Persian architecture, then embody it on paper. Church even chose a name for his estate that evoked ancient Persia, derived from the Greco-Roman geographer Strabo, Olana referenced a fortress or treasure storehouse near the ancient Persian capital in the Ararat Valley, established during the same period as Petra. And so while certain design features of his home are specifically derived from his Middle Eastern trip, many are not. Church is less interested in making any claim for a kind of precise cultural transcription as he is in the opportunity to imagine Persian architecture and then to make himself the author of it, embodying these ideas on paper and then seeing them take shape in wood and stone and paint. This is not unlike Frederick Layton's approach to his contemporaneous home in London, which includes a striking space he called the Arab Hall. Layton's aim, as art historian Louise Campbell has suggested, was not archeological accuracy, but rather to demonstrate the nature of his own aesthetic preoccupations and the power of the artist to create, synthesize, and transform. Church's home is very much a pastiche of forms and styles. The house is both an imagined Persian fortress and an Italian villa, with incredible polychromatic ornamentation throughout and design elements borrowed from the Gothic Revival, French Second Empire, and East Indian styles. Inside, objects from his far-flung travels consume the space. Court Hall, the large central room in the heart of the house, and here are four views of it, is itself a kind of treasure storehouse filled with vivid colors, fabrics, and textures. Plush chairs are draped with fur-trimmed throws. Sinuous metal teapots sit ceremoniously on carved side tables. Persian armor is displayed on the stairwell's landing and flanked by bronze cranes perched upon turtles. There are Chinese and Japanese pictures, a Mexican Madonna, a gilded Buddha, and mounted South American butterflies. The landscape is designed using the 18th century vocabulary of the picturesque. As conceived by British theorists and garden designers, the picturesque was characterized by complexity, irregularity, and contrast. Its effect, as one writer noted, was to excite and nourish curiosity. The aesthetic allowed church to shape and frame the landscape, not to create a single composition, but to construct an almost infinite number of views, translating, in a sense, the proliferation of detail present in his celebrated mid-century canvases into the physical environment. Trees were planted not only to form and shape pathways and scenery, but to be individual objects for contemplation just as they had been on his early sketching trips with Thomas Cole. And a plan created in 1886 by his son, Frederick Joseph Church, then a college student, depicts Olana's central features, including the patterned planting of trees the artist overtook, undertook. After a trip to Jamaica, where the artist had sketched the abundance of ferns while his wife collected them, they established a fern garden at the north of the house. An orchard and a working farm provided revenue and took up half the acreage. Church converted what was once swampland fed by springs into a 10 acre lake, the largest feature of the property. The artist used windows, entryways and architectural features to frame his new landscapes. Arguably the most important feature of the picturesque landscape 
is its roads. They allow for this movement in and through the land. Five and a half miles of roads traverse Olana's terrain, directing the spectator both physically and visually. This serpentine course was designed to weave in and out of the woods, past the lake, gaining and losing elevation until reaching the top of the hill where a full view of the house is suddenly revealed, softened by a screen of leaves in the warmer months and starkly dramatic in the colder seasons. With Alana, church creates for both the eye and the body. The picturesque landscape moves visitors through space in order to teach them how to see. So often criticized for sacrificing the ideal for the real, all those details. With Alana, Church explicitly works with the stuff of the natural world. He does not represent a landscape, he makes one. The visitor does not just see into the landscape, he or she stands in it and moves through it. Nature is not the subject matter, but the matter itself. As he created his home and landscape, Church returned to the sketches from his 1868 journey to the Middle East. Six years after the trip in 1874, he painted one of his most arresting compositions, El Cosne Petra. It may be his last entirely right-handed picture before degenerative rheumatism set in and painting became increasingly more difficult, especially at a large scale. In this image of the Holy Land, the artist dispenses with many of the traditional features of landscape painting. There is no sky beyond a mountain range, no framing trees or foliage. In fact, there is no background at all and therefore no visual recession between near and far space. One reviewer at the time called it a great upright landscape. The painting's focused, flattened composition creates a telescopic effect, as if Church were attempting to distill its essence into a glimpse of light and rock. As he expansively shaped the many acres of land around him into landscape, this canvas speaks to a different impulse the desire to condense the experience of this spiritual sight into a single view, a view that registers in many ways as itself a detail. He then placed this painting in his home, bringing the sacred geography of that Middle Eastern site into his own world. A concept that emerged at exactly this moment, sacred geography, denoted the conviction that Christianity, rather than being at odds with new scientific advances, could in fact be better understood through them. Literally, this entailed mapping out the Holy Land and its biblical sites, finding them in the present in order to authenticate their existence in the past. Studying the landscape, above all paying close attention to geological forms, became a means to find physical proof for scriptural accounts. For Church, who was religiously observant and also deeply versed in scientific theories, such a joining of these realms would have been especially appealing. Traveling to the Holy Land in 1868 provided an opportunity to consider how landscape painting might intersect with sacred geography. His trip to Petra offered a particular challenge. Rediscovered during, this, during the period, the ancient city of Petra, meaning rock in ancient Greek, had been the capital of the Arabian kingdom of Nabatea and a thriving center of commerce for hundreds of years, beginning in the second century BCE. Costly goods from China and India, ivory, perfumes, spices, and silks came through Petra on their way to Mediterranean markets. The city in present day Jordan was built on a plain bordered by cliffs and the Dabataeans carved their buildings out of the rock. 
They also carved out a necropolis, creating monumental tombs for their royal leaders. One such tomb is the Kazne, a tomb of an unknown king, which Church chose as his subject. While his family stayed behind in Beirut, Church undertook the rigorous journey to Petra, accompanied by two clergymen, an American missionary and a British minister, whose presence underscored the religious motivation of the trip. The difficult and at times dangerous trek to Petra constituted both a spiritual pilgrimage and an aesthetic quest. While there, the painter sketched this long abandoned city's strange monuments, towering facades of buildings carved out of rose-colored stone. Church was immediately fascinated by this mysterious site and its astonishing optical effects. Here was a beautiful temple, he wrote in his diary, shining as if by its own internal light. In Arabic, Kazne means treasury, but the Kazne is not a treasury, as was often assumed in the 19th century. This is, in fact, a tomb. Its facade and embellishments are characteristic of tombs, and the structures adjacent to it are all tombs. But as the most prominent tomb in the city, presumably created for a king, the Kazne was also made to look like a temple in order to emphasize the importance of the deceased. According to scholars, what sets this temple-like tomb apart is its tremendous height, 127 feet, its extraordinarily delicate details, and its dramatic framing provided by the narrow rocky corridor known as the Seek, through which one could access the monument. Church sketched by candlelight while visiting the tomb for the purpose, as he wrote, of fixing these details now fresh in my memory. The friezes, capitals, consoles, and pediments of the Kazne are decorated with the flora with flora and fauna of all kinds, grapes, pomegranates, poppies, pine cones, wheat, laurel, and ivy. These details all signify life after death. Castor and Pollux, who flank the entrance, continue this theme. They served to protect travelers in this world and in the next by accompanying the dead to the afterlife. The figure on the top center portico is often identified as Isis, the personification of grief, who in mourning for her murdered brother Osiris had condemned the earth to winter. Only after Osiris was resurrected could the world again enjoy the bounty of warmth. The Kazne thus represented loss and rebirth, death and life. But Church's painting does not make such symbolism apparent. The smaller decorative motifs register as organic forms rather than specific plants, a notable departure from his depictions of animate nature in previous canvases. There is an effect of precision, curling tendrils springing out from the column's capitals, dentil molding below the cornices, the refined geometric forms of the pediment and the doorway, all of which stand in contrast to the surrounding rocks. These rocks convey an unformed primal sense. Deep brown and black strokes applied in all directions delineate their topography, striated by the lines of the brush pulling through the pigment, giving the surface itself a roughness that is rare in Church's pictures. The rocks both block the light of the sun and reflect it as orange and red highlights scattered across the dark paint near the opening. The figures in relief on the monument are unreadable. They were, as the artist wrote, worn and disfigured. But on Church's canvas, they adopt a much more apparitional quality, as if they were receding into the smooth stone behind them. In El Kazne Petra, Church paints a monument for an unknown ruler, a treasury with no treasure, a city once a rich capital for trade that became a desert necropolis. The artist struggled to translate into words the allure of this ancient monument. 
his fascination evident throughout his letters and diary from the journey. Writing to his close friend, the sculptor Erastus Dow Palmer, he described the strangest scene of desolation. The painter spends pages in his journal attempting to characterize the color of the cosne, not only owing to its unique hue, not pink, he cautioned, more like a beautiful, rich, reddish salmon color, but also because of a more practical reason. The Petra Bedouins generally did not allow any images to be made of the site. As the story went, an artist had once been shot at while attempting to draw it. Although Church was not disturbed, he created his sketches in a distinctly tense and unpredictable atmosphere. It is as if he hoped to relay the drama of his own experience by portraying years later, only the haunting illumination emerging through those stern rocks. With its vertical format and lack of sky, El Casne Petra is not an expansive composition like so many of Church's other works. An earlier painting based on his trip to the Holy Land, Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, adopted a panoramic breadth and a more cartographic approach. Visitors were even provided with an engraved key that numbered and named the sites, many of which were so small as to be nearly indiscernible to the naked eye. What is significant and what is insignificant are quite literally mapped out. The key provided a clear set of directions as to how to read the canvas, where to stand and what to look at. The spectator is supposed to stand in the early spring on the Mount of Olives facing west, the line of text states at the bottom. Thus the American viewer, as art historian John Davis has argued, could follow in the footsteps of Christ, beholding the same religious vision of the ancient landscape and walled city. But without the key, looking at the painting alone with its minuscule yet insistent details, the viewer might miss this divine vision. El Casne Petra has no key or map-like clarity. In its very form, the picture replicates the stunned state that church and so many travelers experienced when first encountering the Cosne. One feels, the painter wrote, engulfed among the most tremendous of these sublime precipices. The sprout from which Church chose to portray the Casne was not the ideal perspective to view the monument, according to the guidebook Church owned, J. L. Porter's Handbook for Travelers in Syria and Palestine. For a commanding spot, Porter suggested that the traveler climb a high cliff on the north side of the necropolis. Here the monuments would, as Porter wrote, spread out before him like a map. Church's van vantage point provides anything but a sweeping vista. Rather than representing a vantage point from above, the artist places the viewer closer to the ground at a visual disadvantage. As a result of this perspective from middle space, there is no clear indication of one's relationship to the subject and thus the monument becomes an even more ambivalent object. This site on biblical soil is at once an imposingly divine signature in stone, perhaps proof of a sacred geography, and a delicate, almost ethereal facade, a mysterious vision. The painting's perspective would have come as a denial of expectations, as the viewer of Church's canvas would have anticipated not only a horizontal composition, the traditional landscape format, but also a more forceful confrontational narrative, including the two Bedouin figures who emerged from a dark cavern in the left foreground. Both carry long rifles, their postures indicating a sense of readiness and unease, facing outward as if guarding the site. And you can see them just barely right here and here. 
um, is a preliminary sketch of the two Bedouins Church did back in his Alana studio. Yet these figures are extremely difficult to discern, as you can no doubt see in the painting, and they do not directly engage us. Rather, they look out past the viewer, appealing to something beyond or behind the spectator's vantage point, something unseen. El Casme Petra also denies one of the key components of landscape, background. In a pencil sketch of the site, Church had included the merest hint of a background space, a narrow vertical area at the very top of the sheet, underlined and labeled sky. If you can see it right up here. In the painting, no hint of sky remains. I think I have a little detail of this sketch just to, just to show you his annotation there. The eye is not allowed to escape into the distant light in the painting, as in many of his other contemporaneous pictures, like the afterglow, which hangs in the sitting room at Alana. Here you can see it. Uh, near El Casme Petra, and Syria by the Sea, a large painting in the collection of the Detroit Institute of Arts that was inspired by Church's Middle Eastern trip and in which a warm haze beyond the ancient ruins beckons. Instead, in El Casme Petra, the eye is kept locked in the crevice of light between the cliffs, unable to move up to the sky or within to the interior of the temple. Through its form, the painting confronts the viewer more directly, more viscerally than any of Church's earlier canvases. What results is a sense of both intimacy and obstruction. The monument shines with the startling brilliance of the Andes of Ecuador, but its composition is not an immersive overture a staging of visual transcendence as with Church's earlier work. The details of this tomb, Isis, Castor, and Pollux may refer to an afterlife or the possibility of redemption, but the painting itself obscures them. A few years after producing El Casne Petra, Church undertook his last large-scale canvas. The Aegean Sea reinstates a plurality of details, but primarily by reusing parts and gestures from his own works. An ancient structure similar to the Parthenon, uh, a painting here you see of 1871, appears in the middle distance in the Aegean Sea. So you can see it right up here. Ruins found in Syria by the sea are incorporated in the right foreground. The facade of one of the tombs of, at Petra is included at the lower left, and you can see it over here. This rose-colored monument is not the Kazne, but another tomb the church had sketched during his journey. Through this work, the artist remembers himself combining pieces from his oeuvre, holding them together with a sky laden with clouds and a double rainbow painted like the British artist Jan W. Turner with thick whites and yellows. Such recombination is at work in the installation of El Casne Petra in Church's home. Shortly after its display at the National Academy of Design, the artist presented it to his wife as a gift. It is the one large scale finished canvas that the painter kept for display in his home. He installed it over the mantel above the fireplace, directly across from a floor to ceiling window with views of the landscape beyond. This was the family's favorite room, an intimate space adjacent to the lavish court hall and the Umbra a recessed veranda that forms a kind of shadow box theater from which to view the Hudson. Church also designed the sitting room's color scheme to echo and complement the painting. 
with its hues and the frames geometry referenced throughout the room, the bold confrontational effect of the work is dispersed across the interior space, as if providing the eye with places of refuge beyond the Sikh's unsettling path. The picture's placement works to domesticate its disruptive effect. The installation also aestheticizes Petra the place, which had caused church such anxiety and had even threatened death. He faced two questions while sketching there. Would he be able to represent this strange place on canvas? And would he even be able to put pencil to paper at all without encountering resistance or physical harm? But in the parlor, such danger is reimagined as a comfortable uncertainty, even a triumph. The painting registers as one detail of the room, as well as one part of a wider network of objects, views, and architectural elements. The gilded frame with its intricate geometric patterning, the inlaid wood and ornate pink marble that constitute the fireplace, the decorative insets in the doors, the painted stencil border that wraps around the room at top and bottom, framing windows and entryways. El Casne Petra both comes into being and comes apart before our eyes. I have made about one and three quarters miles of road this season, opening entirely new and beautiful views, Frederick Church wrote to a fellow artist in 1884 as he continued his work on Alana. I can make more and better landscapes in this way than by tampering with canvas and paint. If in El Casne Petra Church attempted to condense into a single view, a sense of divinity and the sublime, fear and revelation, personal experience and sacred narrative, with Alana, he worked expansively, imagining art, architecture and environment as fundamentally inseparable and like one of his great mid-century canvases, a means to shape the world anew. So thank you so much. And hopefully there'll be a little time for questions. Thank you so much, Professor Rob. Really an incredible journey you've taken us on there. I think everybody has seen that kind of uh, power of observation that is, is one of your greatest gifts, helping us, even who, who live with these objects and uh, these structures and views, to see them really differently. And I don't think I've ever felt quite as uh, claustrophobic with uh, El Cosme Petras before. You showed me how he's snuffed out that bit of sky and um, it made you closed in and cloistered in this uh, kind of uncomfortable way. So just one little glimpse and we've had some uh, great questions thrown out there and uh, would love to dive right into it. Um, one quick mention is you, you gave our audience a glimpse of the Andes of Ecuador early on and I should mention that that uh, great canvas plays a role in our uh, upcoming exhibition, Cross Pollination, um, Heat, Cold, Church in Our Contemporary Moment. We'd hope it would travel to all venues of the show, but at least when that traveling show is at uh, Reynolda itself, uh, the Andes of Ecuador will be included in its installation, so that'll be uh, great to see. Um, I was uh, rem remarking and reflecting on how you bridged with church the celestial and the terrestrial between which there could be a contradiction, the, the earthy tainted with sin, the low and the, um, the, the menial as opposed to that heavenly light, that, that pupil as you uh, referred to it um, up above. Uh, a question that comes of that is how you see this terrestrial uh, project that brings us together, Olana, um, in relation to all this. And I know one of our uh, attendees here, um, uh, Karen Zukowski, who's just thrown out another question, has in the past commented on how uh, the project of making Olana was explicitly celestial in a way that it was maybe um, trying to make a new Eden. And there are some uh, primary sources that would encourage us to read it as um, Edenic. Um, how do you reflect on the Olana project in relation to this um, global spirituality you've evoked for us? Yeah, 
I mean, I think there's certainly, you know, as, as Karen argues, a kind of a sense of, of creating um, a kind of Eden of sorts, but I, I think it's, it's also one in which um, there's a real reflection on, on kind of ecology and a kind of interconnectedness and a way of um, you know, reforesting the landscape and re-envisioning it um, as, as, as both a, sort of a productive environment, um, you know, thinking of the orchards and the farm, um, but also one that is sort of uh, aesthetically generative that will be for him um, a, a means to, you know, think about the world and, and represent it, um, you know, whether through his sketching practice, sort of the transition away from large scale canvases. Um, so, you know, I think it's working at, in very, at, in various ways um, for church and at various moments too. I and mean, I think there is, um, you know, so much a way in which it's, you know, it's across, uh, across the river from, from Cole's home. Um, he's reflecting on, on that view and that relationship. Um, but I also think, you know, that there's, there's something really kind of um, ecologically generative about it as well um, uh, that tends to go more overlooked um, and, and, and thinking about how, you know, the, to your point about the sort of celestial and the terrestrial, that there's, uh, that there's something about working with the earth that this, that this project entails that is um, uh, kind of reinvigorating for him at this point in his career. Um, we had a couple of questions that uh, related to uh, issues of framing, uh, which you discussed so powerfully and kind of brought full circle at the end with that um, pairing of El Casne Petra and this uh, iconic view across the lake at Olana. Um, to Olana's staff wanted to, to push you to go one step further there. Uh, Sean Sawyer and uh, Carolyn Keo were both intrigued by this and um, wanted to see if you would draw an explicit link um, in the making of a composition like Petra and the making of a composition like that view from the end of the lake. Um, um, to reflect on that a little further would be most welcome. And I'll, I'll add into the same question, another uh, framing related question from Professor uh, Ed Sullivan of the uh, Institute of Fine Arts at NYU, who is struck by how that same kind of framing feels not unlike a stage. Uh, and he's uh, curious about the theatrical um, in these pictures. Yeah, so the, to the first question, um, the, the framing of the landscape in terms of the window and the, the view beyond, am I, I'm, I hearing you right on? I, I, I think so, know. and yeah, maybe they will jump in if I haven't got it correctly, but yeah, both Sean and Carolyn are eagerly waiting with uh, bated breath to see if you will tie a bow on top of it and help us to understand uh, that view that is so important to our, our future plans, our, our long-term projects at Olana, um, and uh, a similar kind of vision that's at work in that one great finished masterpiece that was meant to live at Olana. Yeah, I mean, it's so striking, right, when you when you move through the house and when you move through the landscape, this notion of kind of framing and the kind of expansive idea of what a frame and what a composition entails. And I think that there, uh, you know, that the fact that this of all of all the works of art, that this is the one that he chooses. Um, and the, the, the frame itself is, is really extraordinary, um, the geometry there, um, but also the sort of framework of the Sikh and, and the ways in which this is not a typical composition for him in so many ways. And one of which is, is just the kind of um, sort of abstracted brushiness of the sort of framing of the rock. So it really, um, does seem like a kind of experimentation with framing, which is obviously simultaneously being undertaken um, in, in terms of uh, the work of the house and the work of the landscape. So, I mean, I, I think that's a wonderful point to sort of uh, think of it as, you know, as, as, as what, you know, of, of the frame itself being as important in some ways as the view um, and that that placement there in the room across from that particular window out into the landscape does sort of emphasize that um, even further. And I think um, to Edward's point, hi Edward out there, <laughs> it's great to have you here. Um, 
I, I think that there is very much a kind of theatricality and thing. I mean, you know, I zoomed past the the uh, the four um, photographs of Court Hall, but uh, the sort of curtains there are, and the kind of amateur theatrics that were staged there are, are so crucial to that room. And I think standing in it, you get that sense even more. Um, so it, it's it's interesting to think of that also is sort of doubled in this much more intimate environment of the sitting room, but also again in the painting itself. And I think there is a kind of um, sort of theatricality in that view alone. I mean, there's, you know, if one, if you've ever been to Petra, you know, that journey towards the temple is um, incredibly dramatic and the kind of unveiling. So I think even though this guidebook that he brings with him um, which is first published in 1858, really assumes that the best view is going to be the most expansive one, the one from sort of on high, the sort of more celestial view as it were. I think again, it sort of brings us back to his interest in something that's at once more kind of theatrical and more sort of embodied um, or terrestrial. <laughs> Um, one that's more about the physical environment and sort of matter and stuff um, than it might be about a kind of, you know, Emersonian eyeball. Uh, so I think in that way, there is a kind of aspect of the kind of theatricality and the materiality of that framework um, that both sort of harkens back to the actual experience of the site. Uh, but also sort of what he's trying to do with Alana um, in, in terms of thinking about um, the physical world and its possibilities. You've, I think, given me an ideal follow on there with your mention of uh, the embodied physical experience of the Olana landscape and you know where this is going. There's a, a famous legend of uh, Professor Rob that when she was a devoted graduate student working on a, a church dissertation, she got to know this place in an unusual way by training for a marathon running the carriage roads of Olana. So I would be curious to hear you uh, reflect on how that changed your understanding of this place. Yeah, I mean, I, I I don't think I ever would have written the book I did without that kind of part of the so-called research process. Um, you know, there's there I, it, there was such a focus when I started the work on you know what was in the archives, reading all the letters, reading the journals, uh, looking at the inside of the house and. You know, I just happened to be um, doing a lot of running at that time, and obviously it's a great place to run, but because of that, then I was in his landscape, constantly moving through it, you know, different times of different, um, you know, uh, different conditions, looking at different views. Uh, you know, I started to take a little piece of paper and make some notes along the way. And it did, you know, make me realize that this is this is a project that is not limited to the collections or um, the physical structure of the house. This is um, a project that is as much, if not more, about the landscape. Um, and thinking of that as as a part of a whole, uh, in in terms of his career and in terms of the undertaking of Alana, was uh, was hugely helpful. That's a great deal of sense, and we're all the things. Yeah, it's yeah. a more expansive view, especially during the time of COVID, of, sure. of what research constitutes. There you go. Um, let's see, we've got a couple more questions here. Uh, also just enthusiastic comments from, from Sean Sawyer, also from uh, Dr. Christine Oaklander, who um, again talks about how you uh, defamiliarize these uh, iconic objects usefully. Um, she, she is now thinking about church as a kind of American pre-Raphaelite, which is a way we don't think of him very often, um, but the, that kind of detail, again, that buzzword, that keyword, um, she's, she's finding herself reflecting on it differently. So yes, a little taste of how our, our audience has really valued this. Um, another framing related question from Karen Zukowski, maybe just one or two more here. Um, the, the other aspect of the framing in that room beyond that uh, fascinating frame that we understand church design is the, the inscription on the fireplace uh, right there, which is almost perfectly in the space of a little cartouche that would identify the picture, but does not seem to do so. Uh, what do you make of that inscription? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it seems to me, again, a, a part of this kind of decorative language um, and, uh, you know, a sense of, of uh, you know, of continuing these motifs and of writing as part of that. Um, and and um, I, it's, it, it, 
correct me if I'm wrong, right? But it doesn't, it, it's not, um, it, it doesn't actually translate. The, the one above the fireplace does, and then the other that you reproduce the, uh, the painting on the wall doesn't. Uh, so yeah, the one above the, the fireplace one, is, yeah. uh, while, the, the one, uh, while the fire burns, I muse, a quote from one right. of the Psalms. Yeah. Right, right. I was, yeah, so yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have a revelatory reading of that one, but I have always found it interesting that the other is, um, is uh, you know, not, not related to, you know, not translatable. And I, I, you know, I think he's, this is, again, takes us back to this idea of sort of imagining Persian architecture. This is not going to be a kind of transcriptive process, but one of, um, that's sort of centered on uh, the self and, and a kind of reimagining of, of forms and recombination um, that's, that's taking place in fairly sort of wild ways um, in that particular small space across the, the room, especially with the stenciling above and below and across the doors. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe one last question here, as you've taken us on this uh, usefully uh, global journey away from our uh, immediate uh, domestic political concerns, um, Dorothy Heil finds herself reflecting on this term that we use so often in the, the business of Olana, this problematic uh, label, the Hudson River School. How do you wrestle with that well understood brand name, widely marketable, and uh, uh, we should, uh, we are lucky to have the problem that so many people know it and love it, um, but clearly we're talking about much more than paintings of the Hudson River Valley. Uh, what use do you find for that term, if any? Yeah, I really don't find it useful at all. I mean, I try not to use it. I mean, I understand that it's recognizable, um, but even sort of using it as sort of so-called seems problematic to me. I mean, in part because this is um, this is a far more global story. It's not just an American story, and it's a story very much about place. And I think talking you know, about the Hudson River Valley and its specificities and its environment is incredibly important. Um, and the work that Alana is doing is vital to that. Um, but I think we have to see it as constantly expansive. Um, and so that, you know, I, I think that bends back on itself in, in ultimately really unhelpful ways because this is a much broader conversation and I think it's a much more interesting one. Um, the the more expansive it can be. So thinking of them just in terms of, um, you know, Hudson, uh, which, and it's, uh, it's, of course, starts out as a pejorative term as well. So, I mean, it's understandable in terms of branding, but like many brands, I think it's um, uh, <laughs> unfortunate in, in, in many ways in terms of its um, helpfulness. I thought we were at our final question, but certain privileges come from being a past speaker in our series and, and one of the, the world's leading authorities on uh, Orientals, Professor Mary Roberts of the University of Sydney has woken up early to attend here and um, she has an interesting question for you here as our last. Uh, given your work on Cole and his house, how do you think about the relation to this property beyond Alana's boundaries? How do you think a church conceived its place in the broader field of his landscape, uh, landscape architecturing? Yeah, well, hi, Mary. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I, I think, you know, in terms of the sort of landscape architecturing question, it, it, it is really interesting because I think, you know, I think at this moment, he does make this kind of transition in terms of thinking himself not as not just a painter, um, but in, in thinking of himself in terms of the environment. And it's interesting that it would be, you know, landscape architecture rather than architecture and then that might sort of you know differentiate him somewhat from others like Leighton um uh but you know I think it's it it's something that he's incredibly engaged in in this moment of of thinking about the kind of possibilities of you know the kind of the, the picturesque uh environment um and uh and the art the artist's home so not just as a kind of tour through the landscape but as a kind of self-contained project which is maybe more a kind of mid-century phenomenon than say a kind of late 18th early 19th century one so um this sort of this kind of creation of um, of the environment of the ground as itself, the kind of landscape project as a, a kind of 
uh, holistic aesthetic endeavor, um, I think is, is, is how he's imagining it at this time that, you know, many are, are considering what this might mean and in a much more kind of public way as well. And that, that is the kind of interesting tension here with church is that it, it has this kind of public nature. It's certainly not sort of Central Park and he's part of that commission as well. Um, but how public should it be? It's also a private endeavor. So I think there is a kind of interesting tension that probably don't have time to, to go into in terms of the kind of public private, but it is also why now we have the chance to kind of think through it in terms of it's, it as a kind of public space, which is the direction that in many ways um, that format goes with Vox and Olmsted and others. It's a great note to end on. Thank you so much, Professor Rob, and thank you all for joining us for this Alana webinar. Uh, please stay tuned. There will be more coming up this spring, just getting started. Great.